This week we are talking about Module 7, or Chapter 7, which is on ratios, rates, and proportions. In this module, we are going to talk about what is a ratio and how to write them. We're going to then expand it into a rate and a unit price, which are some applications of ratios. Then we're going to make it into an equation, and that's going to be called a proportion. And then, of course, we're not just going to get proportions. We're going to have those real-life applications. That's going to come across to us as word problems. A ratio is simply our favorite F word, fraction. It's just written as in disguise. A ratio is something that can be written as a fraction or a ratio of two items. Now you might see it in the words, oh, what is 5 to 11? Well, that ratio of 5 to 11, we want to be able to write as a fraction. So the first number would be your numerator. The 2 essentially is your division line, and the second number is your denominator. And that's how you would write a ratio as a fraction. Now, your book does also mention about how ratios can be written in a colon notation. We don't really use that a whole lot, or we won't be using that a whole lot. But just so you are familiar, once again, would be your first number first. So it's 5 colon for the word 2, 11. 5 to 11. Now, ratios are not always written with a small number first and the large number second. We could also have the ratio of 11 to 5. And once again, you need to realize that the first number is your numerator, and the second number ends up being your denominator. Same idea when you are writing it in your colon notation. The first number goes first, the 2 is your colon, and the second number is after that. It's okay to have an improper fraction meaning it's top-heavy. Ratios are not always proper fractions. Sometimes fractions, or the ratio that is given, needs to be reduced, just like when we reduced our fractions. It's a way of stating the same ratio. So this ratio is 18 to 27. But we know that we can reduce that because 9 goes into both of those. So I can rewrite the 18 as 9 times 2, and I can rewrite the 27 as 9 times 3. And as we've discovered, any number over itself is 1, and 1 times any number leaves me with any number, so I'm left with the 2 thirds. So the ratio of 18 to 27 is equivalent or the same as the ratio 2 to 3, or 2 thirds. We can do that with ugly decimals as well. If I have the ratio of 3.6 to 12, now in this case we have a decimal within a fraction. That is the antichrist of Mathland to have a decimal within a fraction. So the first thing we have to do is get rid of the decimal in our numerator. Now we have to do that legally. Remember to move a decimal point over a spot is just multiplying by 10. So I'm going to take the top and I'm going to multiply it by 10. Now we are well aware in fractions, if I do something to the top, I have to do the exact same thing to the bottom to keep it balanced. This is going to give me an equivalent uh, fraction or ratio of 36 to 120. Now that's not reduced. Oh, what goes into both of those? Well, I'm not quite sure. Those are kind of big numbers. I do know that 6 goes into 36 and 6 goes into 120, so I'm just going to reduce it by 6. 6 goes in here 6 times, 6 goes in here 20. So now I have 6 over 20. Now those are both even numbers, so now I can reduce it further and say, okay, 6 uh, has a 2 in it, 2 goes in there 3 times, 20 has a 2 in it, it's 10. So my final ratio would be 3 tenths. So 3.6 to 12 is equivalent or the same as 3 to 10. I bet we have one more that's got, okay, so we did decimals. I bet this book is going to do something else to us. What do you think the next one's going to be? Yep, you're right. The next one's going to include our mixed numbers. Extra excitement there. First of all, it's written in the word form of a ratio. It's two and a quarter to five and a half. We have to write it as a fraction first. So that's, once again, the first number goes on top. 
So it's two and a quarter. Two is like your division bar. And then we got five and a half on the bottom. Now, Audra says whenever we are dealing with mixed numbers, the first thing you want to do with it is convert them to improper fractions. Remember, that's our little circle. We start on the bottom and we do a little multiplication and addition. So it's four times two, which is eight. Then plus one is nine. Now, the two and a quarter didn't become the number nine. It became nine fourths. Still have your denominator. Do the same thing on the bottom. Two times five is 10. Plus one is 11. Now, five and a half didn't become 11. It became 11 halves. Now, this is considered a complex fraction, and I think you will agree that that's very complex looking. But a fraction is also a division problem. So we have a fraction divided by another fraction. Dividing fractions is as easy as pi, flip the second, and multiply. Well, the second one in this case is our bottom fraction. So this problem ends up being equivalent to, don't switch that first one, it stays 9 fourths. But instead of dividing by 11 halves, it's times 2 elevenths. Because a fraction really is a division problem, so we have a fraction divided by another fraction. We divide fractions by multiplying by the reciprocal, or flipping the second. And then I would reduce. 2 goes into 2 once, 2 goes into 4 twice, and then multiply straight across. 9 times 1 is 9, and 2 times 11 is 22. So 2 and a quarter to 5 and a half is the same ratio as 9 to 22. A rate is a specific type of ratio. A ratio that we were talking about before oftentimes compares two of the same items uh, or something of that sort, like um, packages to packages delivered. They're both about packages. It just depends on whether they're delivered or not delivered or something of that sort. But a rate compares two different kinds of measures. So your units are going to, or your labels are going to be different. Examples that we deal with all the time about this is something like miles per gallon or miles per hour. Okay. The miles per hour is actually a speed and it's about a distance per time period. Now you'll notice that in all of these it talks about the word per. All of them have per in it. Per is an important word when it comes to your ratios because per means divide. So when we're finding about miles per gallon, we calculate that by taking the miles and dividing it, which is our fraction bar, the same thing means divide, and then you put the gallons after. So you take the number of miles you've traveled and divide it by the gallons it took you. Same idea for miles per hour. You take your miles and you divide it by the time it took, your hours. And that is how you calculate a rate, or any old ratio, you read the words. Now, example of a, a rate problem is that I drove 120 miles in three hours. What is my speed? Well, speed is the same thing as miles per hour. Huh? So it tells us that. Now we need to remember that oftentimes it'll say not just speed, it'll say what is my miles per hour? And then once again, you can tell because it asks in the question how to do, set up the problem. So speed is in miles per hour. So what we simply do is you look through the words and you find the word miles, and that's the label on our number that represents miles. So here's our miles. That's the number on top because it's miles, and then we divide by how long it took us. Here's our length of time. It's three hours. And then we divide. 120 divided by 3 is 40. So we traveled 40 miles per hour is how that's usually abbreviated when we're dealing with our speed.
Another application to ratios is another one that we should be dealing with on a fairly regular basis. It's called the unit price. And the unit price is a ratio of price to units. Yeah, I know. Unit price, price to units. Imagine that. When do we use this? We should use this all the time when we are going grocery shopping. Oftentimes we have different size containers for different prices and it's very difficult to compare one brand to another brand because they don't make their size of container the same. So even though it might appear to be cheaper, you're receiving less. So you want to find out the unit price. Now if we're talking about um, items in the grocery store, oftentimes it's broken down to ounces. So it's your price per ounce or your price per pound. So it's the price to the unit that it's measured in. So if it says I have a 20 ounce container of mustard that costs $1.49, what is the unit price? Now they might also be a little bit more specific and say not only do I want the unit price, I want it in cents per ounce. Now in this case they're even telling us the units that they want it measured in. Now here's the issue though. We would find the number of cents or pennies and divide it by ounces. But when I look through my problem I don't see the cent symbol anywhere. I see dollars. Oh, and this goes back to how to convert from dollars to cents that we talked about last weekish. In order to find out, okay, this is a dollar and 49 cents. How many just pennies would that be? Well, remember to convert dollars to cents, you just move your decimal point over two spots to the right, drop the dollar symbol, and add your cent symbol. So, a dollar 49 is the same thing as 149 cents. So now I can set up my ratio <clears> that <throat> asks for cents. So I put in my cents, which is 149. Then I have the word per, which I know means divide. So I write that as a fraction bar. And then my ounces, ounces, ounces. OZ is our abbreviation for ounces. So here's my cents per ounces. <clears throat> and then we divide. Take your 149 and divide it by the 20 ounces to find your price per ounce in cents. Now once again, you're going to end up with a decimal in this answer. That's okay. You end up with 7.45. Now make sure you label all of these word problems will have labels because how, what does 7.45 represent? We don't know. It represents right here. Cents per ounce. That is the unit price for that mustard. So if I was just purchasing one ounce, it was almost seven and a half cents. If you do that with another jar of mustard or a different brand name or a different size and find out the unit price, so for one ounce of a different brand name, you can then compare. Is it a better deal to buy a 20 ounce of this particular mustard or maybe a 14 ounce of another by finding out the price per single ounce? That's why it's called a unit price. It's just for a single unit. You can find out if you're getting a good deal or not. The key on a unit price is don't necessarily go in the order that they give the data in your sentence. It's going to be your price always on top and then divide it by the ounces or the unit that it's measured in. It's price per ounce. Now we're not just going to have a single fraction out there, a ratio that we're just going to talk about and write numbers as ratios. We're going to do things with them. And one of the things we're going to do is set them equal to other ratios. Those are called proportions. Proportions are simply equations. We're going to have some sort of ratio or fraction equal to another ratio or fraction. 
Now before we get into solving a proportion, we need to learn something called the test for equality. This could be used to make sure that we reduced our fractions correctly from a few chapters ago. Say I had 6 eighths and I reduced it to 3 fourths and I want to know did I do that correctly? The test for equality says that for these two ratios or fractions to be equal to each other, the product of their diagonals need to be equal to each other. Well, what does that mean? That means that if you take the diagonal this direction and you multiply it, because that's what a product is, a product is the answer to a multiplication problem. So 6 times 4, if these fractions are equal to each other, that multiplication will be equal to the product of the diagonal going the other direction. So the 6 times 4 would be equal to 3 times 8. And then you simplify the two sides. On the left, 6 times 4 is 24. On the right, 3 times 8 is 24. The two are equal to each other. That tells me that, yes, these two fractions are equal to each other because the product of their diagonals are equivalent. They are the same. We can use that same idea of the test for equality in order to solve proportions. A proportion, they're telling us that the two fractions are equal to each other, but we have one of the unknowns. So we can use that same idea of cross products or multiplying the diagonals to solve because we know that they are equal to each other. In that last problem, we we're saying, are they equal to each other? Now it's saying, okay, I have this proportion, a fraction equal to another fraction. I know that they are equal to each other. That tells me that the product of this diagonal, x times 9, we write that as 9x, will be equal to the diagonal going the other, or the product of the diagonal going the other direction will be equal to 2 times 63. Now we have an equation that doesn't have evil fractions in it that we can solve. First thing I would do is clean this up a little bit. I can multiply 2 times 63. So I'm going to say 9x is equal to 126. Now this is a one-step equation that we learned how to do in week one when you have a number times an unknown, to cancel it out, to get the unknown by itself, we divide. Because this means multiplication when they're mushed together, so the opposite of that is division. And 9 goes into 12 one time with a remainder of 3. 9 goes into 36 four times. So our answer is x is equal to 14. So 14 over 63 would be equivalent to 2 over 9. But we're just solving for the unknown, so we'd say x is equal to 14. The problems don't always end up being so pretty like, so let's do another one just to make sure we have it and we see how our answers might look. Once again, they're telling us that these two fractions are equal to each other. So we want to know what's the value for that x, that unknown, that will make the two true. In order to find that out, we need to find the product of their diagonals and set them equal to each other. Those are called cross products. So x times 4, we would call that 4x. And that will be equal to the product of the diagonal going the other direction. The test for equality tells us that a fraction equal to a fraction has that property, that the diagonals will be equal to each other. Then we can clean up the right side a little bit. So we have 4x is equal to 45. And then we get x by itself by once again canceling out that multiplication. Remember a number and a letter are multiplication. So to cancel that out, we divide. 4 divided by 4 is 1. 1 times x is x. 
So then I'm left with x is equal to, well, 4 doesn't go into 45. So leave this as your answer, 45 fourths. No decimals. Please don't go back to mixed numbers because we're getting you prepared for algebra, and in algebra we don't do mixed numbers. So leave that as your answer. x is equal to 45 fourths. Now, it would be great if all proportions were just simple little fractions equal to fractions that they give you time and time again so that you can just repeat the same procedure over and over and over again, multiply the diagonals, and then solve your little equation. But in real life, we deal with ratios and proportions on a fairly regular basis, and they don't come up to us in regular little equations. It's word problems. That's how we apply proportions. But you need to fear not the word problem. These are some of the easiest word problems that you'll get to, and I'll show you why. If we have an example like this one, two guys are painting. Okay. So they first you start off with usually some sort of statement that tells you what's going on. Here we've got two guys painting. It says they cover 1,600 square feet with four gallons of paint. Now, I'm going to take a time out here and remind us about our labels. The square here is on the label feet, not on the number, because it's covering a surface. A surface area isn't just one-dimensional, it's two-dimensional. So you would take a feet times a feet to find out the area of that, and so the label of feet is being squared because it's finding out how many one foot by one foot squares cover that surface. There happens to be 1600 for this um, first sentence of this example. So remember that the number is 1600. The square is on the label, not on the number. That number is already has that in place. Okay. The other thing that I want to note is that in this sentence they tell us two numbers with two different labels. It's 1,600 square feet and 4 gallons. That's going to make up your first, or your first ratio. It does not matter the order that you put things in. I see the number 1,600 first, so I'm going to put 1,600 per 4 gallons. If you want to put the labels in there to help you keep things organized, that's fine. But remember, they're just labels to, for organization's sake. So the the first sentence tells you what's going on. The second sentence is going to tell you two numbers that are related to each other. The third sentence is going to give you one of those numbers or the, another number with that same label and ask for the other label. So in this case it says how much paint? Well, what do we have as paint? Gallons of paint. So we don't know gallons. So how much paint or gallons will they need to cover? And they give us another one of these feet squares that we had up here. Now I wrote the 1600 on top, that was with my feet squared, so this is going to be equal to, now we match up labels. Since this is square feet on top, I need the other number with square feet to go on top as well. I had gallons on the bottom, gallons of paint. Here it was how much paint, so what I don't know is the number of gallons I need. So to write up a proportion from a word problem, it's all about the labels. They'll tell you two different numbers with two different labels usually that compare each other. Write that as one ratio. And then your second ratio that's going to be equal to it, you just need to make sure that the labels match up. I have feet squared on top over here, so I have to have feet squared on top over there. I have gallons on the bottom here, so it has to be equal to gallons on the bottom over here. Now you just set up your proportion. Multiply your two diagonals and set them equal to each other at this point. You do not need the labels when you write your equation. So we now have 1600x is equal to doesn't matter whether you put the 4 first or the 6,000 first because it's multiplication. 
can simplify that. We have 1600x is equal to 24,000. And then you divide both sides by the 1600 to get your x. x will end up equaling 15 gallons. Label it. It's gallons. If you want to be even more specific, you could do gallons of paint. I think we should try another. Here's another example. If two shirts can be bought for $47, how many shirts can be bought with $200? Once again, your first sentence is telling us two different numbers with different labels with shirts and dollars. It does not matter how you write your ratio for this first step. You can put two on top and the 47 on the bottom or vice versa. What will matter is how you set up the second one. So I see two shirts first, so I'm going to put the two over $47. That's going to be equal to now I go through how many shirts, how many, that means I don't know. So I don't know shirts. Shirts was on top before because the two represents shirts. So my unknown is on top. The 47 is dollars. So my other number with the dollars goes on the bottom across from the like value. Now that it's set up by matching our units, shirts over dollars is equal to shirts over dollars, we can solve our proportion. And then go ahead and solve it. 100 is equal to 47x. To get the x by itself, we're going to have to divide to conquer. Divide by 47, divide by 47. x is equal to 8.5-ish. So I would wait a second. Here's once again where you need to slow yourself down and look back at the question. Don't just think that you're done because you came up with an answer. Make sure that you are answering the question. The question says how many shirts can be bought? I don't know about you, but I don't know how to buy half of a shirt. So I cannot buy 8.5 shirts. How many shirts can I buy? Oh, the five is five or higher, so I round up. I can buy nine. Can we buy nine shirts? 9 times 47 is going to be over 200. I only have $200. I can't buy more than what I've got money for. So I cannot buy 9 shirts. So even though the 5 would say round up, that would round to more me spending more money than what I have. I only have the $200. So how many shirts can I buy? I can buy 8 shirts. Make sure that you go back and read the question and answer appropriately. Another example of applications to proportions is talking about scale models or similar shapes. Here I've drawn similar triangles. They are not exactly the same, but if you look at their shapes, they're pretty much looking kind of the same, but one's bigger than the other. That's a similar triangle. You can do that with any shape. One that's larger than another is considered similar. Scale models do the same thing. You don't actually make a model of a building the size that it's going to be, you make it smaller on a certain scale. And that's the same proportion to get to the larger one. So whether you're dealing with a scale model or a similar shape, you have the same type of thing. This is an application to a proportion. Now, for a similar shape as we have here, we have what we call corresponding sides, the sides that line up. Now, nicely, they don't move the shapes around, so I kind of color-coded our um, sides that are proportionate. The side that is corresponds to the 2 down here is the Y. 
<clears throat> and the side that corresponds with the 1.6 is the 2, and the side that corresponds with x is 3. Now, it says that in similar shapes, the corresponding sides are proportionate. Wow. Well, they have common ratios. So what we do is we find two sides that correspond that have numbers and not letters. That's going to be the 1.6 and the 2. Those are the two sides that correspond to each other. They're both that same diagonal on that side, and they have numbers and not letters. That is what I'm going to write as my first ratio. It's going to be 1.6 over 2. Now, that will be equivalent to the ratio of any other corresponding sides. So I will solve for x first to solve alphabetically. So it's going to be equal to the corresponding sides that are with my x. Now, you have to once again be careful with where your numbers go. The 1.6 is from the smaller shape. The 2 is from the larger shape. So I have to do that same proportion, that same ratio, when I find out my other corresponding sides. So x over here is on my small shape, so it goes on top because the 1.6 was also from my small shape. The side that corresponds, the diagonal going this direction, the slant side this direction, is the 3. That is my first ratio and proportion that I get to solve. Once again, we multiply the diagonal this way. So it's going to be 1.6 times 3 will equal 2x. And then we solve that one. We end up for that one. After we multiply, we would have 4.8 is equal to 2x. Divide both sides by your 2 and get x is equal to 2.4. But we're not done with this problem because there was two unknowns in it. We now have to find the proportion so that we can solve for y. Once again, always start off with the ratio of numbers that were given. You don't want to use the 2.4 that you just solved for, although you could, but if you made a mistake here finding the 2.4, you'll now make a mistake finding your y. So always go back to your original ratio of the numbers that were given in both situations. So that's at 1.6 over 2. Okay. Once again, my 1.6 is from my small triangle, so my next side has to start off with the small. Even though the y is over here, that's on the big shape. I need to start with the 2 on top because that was part of my small shape. And then that's over y. So that is my second proportion. Notice you solve for one variable at a time, writing one proportion for each variable, for one equation. And now we once again do our cross multiply, so it's 1.6y from multiplying this direction is equal to 2 times 2, which is 4. Divide both sides by the 1.6 to get y by itself, we end up with y is equal to 2.5. The same setup is used for scale models. As I said, they'll say one foot is equal to, you know, uh, a quarter of an inch or something of that sort. And so that would be your first ratio. And then you always do the feet on the one side and the inches on the, on the bottom of the next ratio. It's all about your units. Line up your units. And then multiply the diagonals, set those equal to each other, and solve by dividing. Pretty easy week this week. Practice it. Get comfortable with it. We'll be applying the same type of mathematics as we just did here to problems for percents next week.